Okay, the final item of business this evening is a member's business debate on motion 7369 in the name of Sharon Dowie on impact of long-term historical site closures managed by Historic Environment Scotland. The debate will be concluded without any questions being put. I invite members wishing to participate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. And I call on Sharon Dowie to open the debate around seven minutes. Ms Dowie. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am grateful for the opportunity to bring this debate to the Chamber and I thank all the members who supported the motion. We are a nation of proud Scots, proud of our culture, proud of our history and proud of our historic sites. We attract millions of visitors from all around the world to Scotland each year, who come to see our beautiful scenery, our friendly welcoming people and our castles, monuments and heritage sites. Tourism is huge for our economy giving a boost not only to the sites themselves, but also to local businesses, hotels, restaurants, shops and communities where employment relies on these attractions being fully open. But for local communities, they are much more than just tourist attractions. They are often the hub of lots of activities and social gatherings. In February 2022, I made my first visit to Dundonald Castle where I met with General Manager Dr Kirstine Crow and her colleagues from the Friends of Dundonald Castle, the charity that look after it. I wasn't able to see inside the castle at the time of my visit as it was closed due to high-level masonry inspections at the site, but I heard all about their plans for the castle and the visitor centre. All the activities that could take place, the events that could be organised, the visitors they could attract from not only this country but around the world, the involvement of the local community and the lifeline that it gave to those who were involved. But there was one sticking point. This could only happen if the castle was open. All of their future hopes and plans were centred around that. Kirstine and her team have always had a good relationship with Historic Environment Scotland or Hayes. At the time of my visit, they were conducting the first phase of an inspection programme expected to be completed by April 2024. This was proving not to be the easiest of tasks. With many of the properties built for defensive purposes, they had thick walls, narrow doorways, making it a challenge to get access with modern machinery. The inspections required careful planning, with some areas only able to be accessed from above by harness and a rope. And the availability of stone masons was also impacting on the delivery of repairs. HES recently hosted a drop-in session in the Parliament where they engaged with a number of MSPs and were able to discuss how they were progressing with sites in each area. I also recently met with HES on site at Chris Regal Abbey, just outside Maybowl, the ancient capital of Carrick, as my dad always reminded me. Although it still has Harris fencing around it, the team were discussing how they could safely move the fencing to allow more access and let visitors see more of the site. They also planned to put storyboards on the fencing to allow the story of the Abbey to be told. And can I just take this opportunity to thank Craig, Paul and the rest of the team for taking the time to show me around and explain what they were doing. It was very much appreciated. Since lodging the motion, the figure of 60 sites closed is now reduced to 47. While this reduction is welcome, the number of closed sites is still too high. Hez have said they are making every effort to safely reopen sites as quickly as possible, but the government needs to ensure it is engaging with them and giving them all the support they need. Hez continues to deliver traditional skills training at its two stonemasonry training centres in Stirling and Elgin, as well as through their craft fellowship programme. They work with the Construction Industry Training Board, Scottish Qualifications Authority, Scottish Funding Council and Skills Development Scotland to create a sustainable framework of qualifications and apprenticeships. But the sector has faced a shortage of skilled craftspeople including stonemasons, for many years now, and the funding for training must be available to allow the training places to be taken up. The motion called on the Scottish Government to make additional funding available to accelerate the reopening of closed sites, and I am pleased that the Scottish Government has now increased funding for HES. 
I would encourage both to ensure the money is indeed being used to help open closed sites as quickly as possible. In March this year, I again visited Dundonald Castle for the second time. There is still some scaffolding in place for repairs that have yet to be completed, but the castle is open and it is now a hive of activity. It's now open every day from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. and this time I was able to go inside. The 14th century hilltop fortified castle was once home to Scots King Robert II, grandson of Robert the Bruce, and it offers spectacular views across the Ayrshire countryside. When I first walked inside and saw the impressive barrel vaulted ceilings, my first word was, wow. I then understood why the community were so passionate about their castle. On the day I visited, there was a school visit from Glasgow where the kids had an educational talk in the visitor centre, a tour of the castle, and then a guided walk on the grounds, all tying in with the curriculum. Alongside educational talks, they also host theatre productions, movie nights, weddings, and the Dundonald Games. <coughs> They're also home to a number of groups, including a writer's group, a young walking group, Ayrshire's Young Archaeology Club, Crazy Castle Kids, and a Scrabble group, which I'm told is a diverse group and one which is very competitive. By hosting these groups and arranging visits from schools to care homes, these sites provide cosy spaces, education hubs and placement and volunteering opportunities. They are so much more than just a visitor attraction. Although visitor numbers aren't back to pre-COVID levels, the fact that they are open makes life much easier and they are now seeing the return of international tourists, with a visitor book showing tourists from Lithuania, Poland, Italy, the United States, New Zealand and Canada, to name a few. We need to ensure that all efforts are made to secure the long-term viability of Scotland's historic sites, and reopening them gives them a starting chance. To conclude, Presiding Officer, I want to finish with something Kirsteen said to me on my first visit to Dundonald Castle, and it stuck with me and sums up how we feel about our heritage. She said, at Dundonald, the visitor centre is the heart of the community, but the castle is its soul. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Bell. We now move to the open debate. I call first Fiona Hislop to be followed by Stephen Kerr. Around four minutes, Ms. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and congratulations um, to, to the last speaker for bringing forward this debate. Um, the benefits of having heritage and historic sites of national importance in your hometown are endless. The passion and the pride in our sense of place is evidence, and Sharon Dyer just set that out for Dundonald. Not only do our heritage sites bring in tourists from around the globe and support our local economy, they also provide us with a sense of place, of who we are and where we have come from. Sites like Linlithgow Palace in my constituency offer a direct connection to our local history, offering opportunities to learn and engage with the worlds and the stories of the past. Linlithgow Palace, the birthplace of Mary Queen of Scots, was closed at the beginning of lockdown and remained closed following investigations by Historic Environment Scotland into the fabric of the high-level masonry in May 2021, and the scaffolding on the North Range predated all of this. In March last year, I personally requested a site visit to the palace, which I attended with the then culture minister, and was taken up the scaffolding on the north side of the palace to see the range of damage and decay that had been found due to decades of adverse weather. Wetter climates have had their impact on our ruins, advancing that ruination further. The damage meant the necessary repairs required on public safety grounds were substantial. Of course, on and off for decades is the debate in the town around having a glass roof on the palace to allow more functionality, but also in recognition that the continuing ruination and decay of the stonework needed to be arrested somehow, and other countries have taken more radical ways like glassing historic buildings. Perhaps had we done so in years gone by, we would have preempted the current situation. We need to look nationally at a strategic approach to this problem, which at, uh, at least last has been uh, surfaced here, and Heritage England and others will also have to face up to it. Planned management of our ruins of sites and buildings, which themselves evolved in different ways 
between and within different centuries needs addressed and faced up to. The closure of such an important site as Linlithgow Palace has had a massive effect on the town. The connection between the palace, the town and local community is significant. Local business and heritage sites and national tourism are intertwined. And so when heritage sites close, streets lose footfall, businesses lose custom and communities lose their sense of place. Last year, it was revealed uh, that visitor numbers to the Linlithgow Palace had soared from 66,500 in 2013 to 94,718 in 2018, showing the volume of increasing visitors to Linlithgow pre-lockdown. As one of the few closed sites which was previously staffed, and with the largest number of visitors of those closed, the loss of income for Historic Environment Scotland is felt in the town also. Indeed, as a local MSP, I have previously convened meetings between Historic Environment Scotland and the local community groups to ensure visitors who come to the palace would linger longer in Linlithgow. I am pleased that Historic Environment Scotland had announced a partial reopening of Linlithgow Palace planned for this summer, though I understand this is now delayed due to the shocking act of vandalism on the delicate fountain masonry and walls and flagstones of the palace. This sort of action on a national monument is heritage crime and must be treated very seriously. It is worth highlighting that uh, irresponsible acts such as vandalism often take place in closed off spaces in areas where the perpetrators believe they are less likely to be caught and this factor must be considered by HES when they are considering closures and reopening. Presiding officer, as a site of national importance and the heart of a local community, it is vital that Linlithgow Palace can open in full as soon as it is safe to do so. The people of Linlithgow and beyond need their palace and the palace needs its people. Thank you, Ms. Hislop. Uh, I now call Stephen Kerr to be followed by Faisal Chowdhury. Um, around four minutes, Mr Kerr. Uh, presiding officer, um, first of all, congratulations to Sharon Dowie on securing this debate. And I associate myself with the words she expressed. And I also would like uh, to associate myself with the words of Fiona Hislop, um, who I agree with, I hope very much, as I know she has just expressed, that. Lindithgow Palace will be open again soon to visitors because, presiding officer, we have in this country a wonderful history from the wars of independence, Jacobite rebellions, the being at the forefront of the Industrial Revolution, the Enlightenment, the defence and liberation of the free world during the World Wars. This is our story and we can take pride in retelling that story from whatever perspective we choose to tell it. I'm a Scottish Unionist. I believe very, it's very important that we celebrate Scotland's history, whether before or after the Act of Union of 1707, which the anniversary of which was just earlier this week, the 316th anniversary of that event. And I, I think so, if I may express personal feelings on this, I said this before, and I'm going to take the opportunity to say it again, I find it very frustrating in Scottish politics that there are some people in the political spectrum not necessarily members of this parliament, who would consign those of us who believe in being Scottish and British to the margins in the sense that they say that we're not true Scots. Well, I am a true Scot. I love Scotland and I take a great deal of pride and draw a great deal of passion from our nation. Um, and that combination of Scottish and Brit Britishness is enhanced. I think I heard the First Minister um, uh, the former First Minister, say last summer, that she identified as both Scottish and British. And I think that that is a very welcome thing to hear members of the SNP say, because it, it will blunt some of the anger and some of the vile hatred that, uh, that uh, some of us experience. Um, so whether uh, you, like I, believe that Scotland is empowered by being in, within the United Kingdom, or whether you don't, um, I think it's important that we, as members of this parliament, are perturbed and interested in the condition of Scotland's historic sites, the symbols of Scotland's cultural independence. Um, I think all of us who believe in Scotland's nationhood um, would like to see priority given to the accessibility and safeguarding of the key sites that shape 
our Scottish identity. And I would ask Angus Robertson, uh, please, to explain to Parliament fully why it is that after so long, Arbroath Abbey, the site of the signing of the Declaration of Arbroath in 1320, uh, a document of worldwide importance, uh, one of the proud moments of Scotland's emergence as a nation with an identity, why that site is still closed. And we have heard from Fiona Hislop talking about Linlithgow Palace, but I think it's important that we receive reassurances from the Minister, from Angus Robertson, that Linlithgow Palace is going to open uh, soon. What is the delay? Uh, when can we expect it to reopen? This magnificent site, the birthplace of Mary, Queen of Scots. So, as was put forward in the motion by Sharon Dowie, um, those are just two of the now 47 sites that, have, that are managed by Historic Environment Scotland, which are currently closed. For a nation that, to have a greater sense of its own identity, the places where this identity was forged and continues to be shaped must be accessible to all of us. We must learn the lessons from uh, what has happened to some of these historic sites in terms of their upkeep and maintenance. Uh, and deep down, we should resolve, I think, collectively, to support the Scottish Government uh, to see that there is appropriate levels of investment and care uh, placed in those uh, sites of historic Scottish heritage. People who love Scotland, presiding officer, will feel compelled, as I do, to conserve these things that make us the nation we are. And, and for us, one of these things uh, about that make us the nation we are, uh, are are these historic sites. Now, I'm a Scottish Conservative. I believe in conserving. I hope we'll hear from Angus Robertson exactly the steps that will be taken to open up all of the historic sites that have been closed for too long. Thank you, Mr Kerr. I now call Faisal Chowdhury to be followed uh, by Murdo Fraser. Around four minutes, Mr Chowdhury. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, I would like to thank Sharon Dow for bringing this important issue to the Chamber. Uh, I visited Lindgo Palace earlier this year and met with some of Historic Environment Scotland team working there. Uh, they told me about the restoration and preservation work they had been undertaking there. I learned of the unique history of the palace and the important work that Historic Environment Scotland were doing to keep that history alive. Our historic environment is on the front line of climate change, and some of our historic sites need specialized restoration and repair work. During my visit to Linlithgow Palace, I learned about the work that needed to take place there that required skilled laborer and stonemasons to carry out. I agree with Sharon Dowie's uh, motion that Scottish Government must do more to ensure that uh, there is not a shortage of skilled labourers able to provide these skills. Modern apprenticeship in stone masonry should be funded and made more readily available. College and uh, further education courses should be fully funded to be able to teach these important skills. So the Scottish Government took a, a very serious look at stonemasonry and helped develop the stonemasonry uh, facility at Forth Valley College, which was referred to earlier, and indeed at one point doubled the number of apprenticeships in stonemasons. So that commitment is there, but I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary can tell us what the current situation is when he closes the debate. Mr Chowdhury, I give you the time back. Thank you. Uh, thank you for th this intervention, and it's really good to hear that uh, the Scottish mm -hmm. Government is looking into it. And of course, uh, I'll, I'll be uh, wanting to hear uh, the update on this as well. Uh, providing skills to labourers who can help to restore our historic site is crucial to ensure uh, the reopening of some of these sites. Scotland's uh, historic environment provides huge support to uh, Scotland's tourism industry. Statistics shows that the sector generated uh, 4.4 billion in 2019, as well as supporting 68,000 full-time jobs. The local towns 
and businesses around these sites highly benefit from the increased uh, footfall from the tourists and visitors. Many businesses in, this, uh, in areas such as Dumfries and Galway uh, and the Scottish borders heavily rely on this uh, revenue from tourism. These areas had some of the highest reported percentage of site closures or restricted access at the beginning of 2023. Following the COVID-19 pandemic, we must ensure that our historic sites are able to remain open and keep supporting local businesses and tourism in Scotland. That is not possible if 60 historical sites remain closed to the public. The Scottish Government's budget at the end of last year uh, predicted an increase in commercial revenue for historical environment Scotland in the coming year. How will this be met if so many of these important historic sites remain closed? Scotland's historic environment play an important role in keeping Scotland's culture alive. It tells a story of Scotland's past and our cultural heritage. It supports the economy and thousands of jobs. The COVID-19 pandemic hit the arts and culture sector hard, and investment and funding is still needed to help uh, rescue this sector. If many of these historic sites remain closed in the coming months, we cannot hope to revive this important part of our culture. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chaudhry. I now call Murdo Fraser uh, up to four minutes, Mr. Fraser. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I start by congratulating Sharon Dowie on securing this debate? Uh, and I listened with great interest to all the contributions from members in the Chamber already. And it's clear from that that historic environment Scotland properties are an essential part of our history, our heritage, and our culture. But they also have a major uh, economic uh, role to play, and they draw hundreds of thousands of visitors to Scotland and particular localities, people coming from the rest of the United Kingdom and all around the world. And therefore, it's really important that we do what we can to preserve them and ensure that they stay open. And we've already heard about the negative impact of the closures that we've seen over the past uh, few years. Closures that we know have been caused, well, first of all, caused by COVID, but then post-COVID, when we would have hoped they would have re been reopened, a range of issues around the fabric of these buildings were identified. Uh, I saw for myself on a visit to uh, Dunkeld Cathedral, close up, uh, how the masonry was crumbling due to the uh, impact of weather as the, the climate gets wetter. Uh, the stonework is actually crumbling, becoming a real risk and threat to visitors. And therefore, HGS have had, had sadly no uh, alternative but to, to, to close these, these properties until they can be properly restored. And we should not underestimate uh, the, 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 the the, the cost and the time that's going to take in many cases. But there is good news. I've seen uh, Dune Castle in my region uh, was reopened uh, uh, last year after some remedial works. Uh, Aberdour Castle in Fife, a lovely property and well worth a visit, was reopened uh, in April um, just uh, last month uh, for the season. Uh, I well remember visiting Aberdour Castle a few years ago, watching uh, Colonel Hugh Fraser's Dragoons, not, I think, in any way related as far as I know, who are a, a reenactment uh, uh, society, reenacting a battle from the 17th century, which I walk with, watched with great interest. And when I was doing research for my book into the Marquis of Montrose and the Marquis of Argyll, trying to understand how battles at the time of the Scottish Civil Wars would develop, watching Colonel, Fraser Hugh, Colonel Hugh Fraser's dragoons with their pike pack was incredibly helpful, trying to understand how uh, battles of the time would have been uh, conducted. But I said earlier I visited Dunkeld Cathedral. Now, I was contacted by a number of constituents uh, last summer who were very concerned that Dunkeld Cathedral and its grounds were closed to the public. And Dunkeld is quite an unusual property because the, the choir, the uh, east end of the property, is still in use. It's a place of worship. Uh, Church of Scotland, an active Church of Scotland congregation, still uses it. The, the west end of the property, the nave, is, is ruined, has no roof, it is in the, in the care of Historic Environment Scotland. And all of the building has been affected by uh, crumbling masonry. 
and that meant that not just the, the building was closed, though the, 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 the actual church services could still take place under a, under a canopy over the entrance, but it meant that the grounds, which are very attractive, very popular with visitors um, down by the River Tay, the grounds were closed too because of the concern about following masonry. And I'm pleased that following um, contact from, from myself and, and, and work that was done by the, the Kirk session, uh, the grounds have now been able to be reopened, so at least people can visit the grounds, and safety fencing has had to be put up around the nave of the cathedral to prevent people getting too close and uh, at risk of falling masonry. But it is terribly sad to see a building like that that should be open and accessible to visitors having to be closed because of the risks. And I saw for myself the work that is being done by HGS to try and restore it. But we shouldn't underestimate uh, how much that's going to cost, nor we should underestimate the difficulties of getting that work done due to the shortage of stonemasons that other members have referred to, where stonemasons are in high demand, not just in our country, but right across Europe. It's very difficult to recruit stonemasons. HGS are doing good work trying to recruit apprentices uh, to bring them on and, and make that an attractive career option, but there's a lot more work to be done. So, uh, I would say to the, to the uh, Constitution Secretary, you know, this is a, a vital issue for Scotland. I'm sure he knows that. It will require funding to support HES. It also requires funding for apprentices uh, to come in and train to be stonemasons. But it is vital to all our communities across Scotland that these historic monuments are put in a condition where not only they can last for future generations, but they can also be enjoyed by locals and visitors as that important part of the visitor economy that we've heard about. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Fraser. I now call on Angus Robertson to wind up the debate. Cabinet Secretary, around seven minutes, please. Uh, Presiding Officer, thank you very much. Firstly, I'd like to begin by extending my warm thanks uh, to the member for providing the opportunity today uh, to highlight and, and discuss the importance of protecting the historic environment for the benefit of, of everybody in Scotland and, indeed, people who travel to this country wishing to enjoy it. Uh, as well. And can I also underscore uh, my appreciation for what I think has been an entirely positive uh, tone and approach right across the parties to the challenge that we know faces our historic uh, environment. In, in addition to Sharon Dowie, we heard from Fiona Hislop, who has been consistently such a strong advocate for Linlithgow uh, Palace, um, a, a call uh, echoed by Stephen uh, Kerr. Um, we heard from Faisal Chowdhury and from Murdo Fraser saying, amongst many other things, um, uh, how important it was to understand uh, the scale of the Im environmental impact uh, that our uh, historic environment uh, faces. And the challenge that, that that then poses, given that we are a country full of castles and abbeys and historic sites, that are, are, are being so challenged um, by um, the environment that we, we live in in the, in the 21st century. The motion mentions the important benefits the historic environment sector delivers, and, and the Scottish Government very much agrees with this. These benefits uh, feature heavily in the revised strategy for Scotland's historic environment called Our Past, Our Future, and the strategy focuses on priorities that have been identified through extensive consultation with the sector and with people across Scotland. These priorities include the core themes of delivering the transition to net zero in response to climate change, empowering resilient and inclusive communities and places, and building a well-being economy, all of which align with Scottish Government ambitions. And so I would therefore commend all members um, who have taken part in this debate or have been in the Chamber th uh, throughout it, I would commend this strategy, which was published on the 28th of April, uh, to all uh, members, and I look forward to its formal launch in, in June. Now, specifically regarding the closure of historic sites, I can appreciate the great frustration that the member uh, and other members uh, are across the Chamber and the wider public feel when they see some of our historic properties with access restrictions. I think we all understand that. However, I feel it's vital that we recognise the reasons for these restrictions, and we've heard about those as well, um, for these restrictions because of the health and because of the, the safety of uh, visitors uh, for Historic Environment Scotland staff and our contractors. Uh, all of these groups 
uh, and all of these challenges must be of paramount importance. Therefore, safety must remain our top priority while the inspection programme progresses and while work to repair our historic properties takes place. And I'd like to recognise that Historic Environment Scotland has acted responsibly with the speed of which access was restricted at affected sites when it became aware of significant high-level masonry concerns. These high-level masonry concerns make it clear that the increasing effects of climate change are having a marked effect on our built environment. Historical structures were not uh, designed or built um, to withstand the current levels of precipitation or the fluctuation in temperatures, which has now become commonplace. And these stresses are not only felt on the original fabric of our historic buildings, but also on historic repair work, which has exacerbated weaknesses in our historic high-level masonry. Now, this situation is not unique to Scotland, since, as we know, climate change is impacting across the world. And although it is far from the ideal situation, I am heartened that Scotland's lead public body for the environment, Historic Environment Scotland, known by many of us as HES, quickly put in place a prioritised inspection programme uh, to assess our historic properties. And this programme of work has allowed sites deemed safe to be reopened as soon as, as possible. And Sharon Dowie, Sharon Dowie was, uh, she um, outlined the numbers which have been able to be opened, and I very much welcome that as well. Uh, this programme of work has allowed sites deemed safe to be reopened or partial access to be provided where it is, is safe to do so. And it's important to note that many of the properties in care are routinely closed for the winter months and Historic Environment Scotland recently announced the reopening of more than 20 sites uh, as part of its seasonal reopenings. I think we can all welcome that. It's also fully reopened or increased access at more than 40 sites as part of the high-level masonry programme. I'm pleased that the member has had the opportunity uh, to visit uh, Cross Regal Abbey, which is affected by high-level masonry issues, to witness firsthand the work being undertaken uh, by Historic Environment Scotland. And I'd encourage other members with affected properties in their constituency or region to take up uh, the offer from Historic Environment Scotland for site visits to learn more about the challenges at individual uh, properties. Happy to give way to Stephen Kerr. Stephen Kerr. I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for giving way, and I stand really to make a plea to him uh, to use his good office uh, to intervene to ensure that the excellent stone masonry coursework that's done at Forth Valley College, which has been highlighted by a number of members, which I've seen myself, which is absolutely superb, that regardless of what the current flux in the finance arrangements are for colleges, that that particular course, and it's vital importance to the work of preservation of our historic uh, sites, that, 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 those course, that, that course will be properly funded and protected. Will he intervene to make sure that happens? I'll most certainly be raising uh, the issues that he, he raised with my culture uh, minister colleague who, who takes the lead on, on, on this uh, issue within the portfolio. Now, un undoubtedly, substantial resources are required to undertake the high-level masonry inspection programme and subsequent conservation work. We're providing HES with unprecedented levels of funding, £72.7 million in 2023 24 to maintain Scotland's heritage and historic environment. This is an 82.6% increase from the £39.8 million level of support before the impact of the pandemic in 2019-20. Very briefly, because I'm running out of uh, time. Fiona Hislop. I think it's very important to reflect on the issues around lost income. And clearly, pre-pandemic, Historic Environment Scotland had a very buoyant income, not least from the Lithgow Palace. So perhaps you might want to give that perspective in presenting such figures. Cabinet Secretary, in, in, Indeed. And taken with the commercial income of HES, which is showing strong signs of recovery, this means that HES's operating budget this financial year is £114.5 million. That is 22.4% higher than before the pandemic. And if I can draw attention to, to members to the increase in, uh, in the top five visited properties in 21-22, all increased by over 300%, with Glasgow Cathedral visited by seven times as many visitors as in 2021. If I can take briefly the opportunity to encourage anybody in the chamber or watching this debate 
to join Historic Environment Scotland. It's an extremely effective way of being able to support the organisation. I've been asked specifically, Presiding Officer, about skills training, which is an extremely important. Um, and a short life working group has been established with a diverse membership to investigate the skills gaps and demand for stonemasons and the working group will shortly report and I'll ensure that members are updated on its work. However, I think it's really important to point out uh, that the shortage of skilled craftspeople has not yet impacted on the high-level masonry inspection programme, as there are other more relevant restricting issues at this stage in the process. This was highlighted by Sharon Dowry correctly. The availability of limited stock of specialist heavy plant hire to undertake high-level work. The remote location of many sites, which causes access issues for the equipment. The protection of certain species of nesting birds, badgers and bats, which delay some inspections. So there are a variety of complications for Historic Environment Scotland. In conclusion, Presiding Officer, the Scottish Government remains committed to the protection and the conservation of our historic environment and is proud to champion the role it plays not only as a defining waypoint in our past, but also for the opportunities it presents in building a fairer and a more sustainable future for Scotland. I again thank the member for raising this debate today and for the other members for their interest and support for the historic environment. I welcome the views that have been expressed in this debate, which have been very helpful in raising the profile of these important issues, and I'll forward on the points raised today to the Minister for Culture, Europe and International Development to inform her future discussions with Historic Environment Scotland regarding this vital issue. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes the debate, and I close this meeting of Parliament.